Kevin and Jade lay naked together, spooning in post codal warmth. Jade turned her head back toward him and Kevin admired the shape of the lines of her neck as they joined her shoulders. He leaned towards her and kissed her deeply, caressing the sides of her face and neck. The sun filtered through the sheer curtains and tweaked his eyes, and they reflexively fluttered open. He closed them again and wished he could return to his dream. Not to be. He threw off the blankets and swung his legs to the floor. Being alone, there was no need to hide his perpendicular state when he took the brief steps to the bathroom, dressed in his boxers. Kevin touched the dark tunnel to bring it to life and opened a document entitled The Jellyfish Device and it was a grade A boner killer. He ate a bowl of cereal as he read through pages of data and turned on the TV and listened to a breaking story. Masked gunman entered a Calgary daycare today. Kevin knew where this was going and turned off the broadcast as soon as he could. Jesus Christ, just when you think they couldn't sink lower. Kevin was horrified, but tried to refocus on the task at hand. He could read fast, but his real talent was that he could focus on technical data and retain what he read. He poured through circuit board diagrams of the proton accelerators and studied every capacitor, every diode, and every component of every module. He organized the functions into sections. There were the copper vacuum tubes and the lasers that created the plasma and propelled the protons. Deuterium protons must be accelerated to at least 4 kilo electron volts so they will fuse and produce neutrons. Then there was the target. Kevin was not a nuclear physicist. He was told the particle accelerators were working, but not aimed finely enough. There were shields between each accelerator to prevent electromagnetic interference with the adjacent devices. Perhaps they weren't working, and the beams were being deflected. Another possibility occurred to him, the timing could be off. He needed to find what the problem was and prevent the apostles from fixing it. He studied electronic diagrams with triangles, bars and squiggles attached with spaghetti lines leading to other combinations of geometric oddities and traced the logic flow along each point. Perhaps the problem was not in the design but in the assembly. Could there be a flaw in how they put it all together? He had learned as much as he could from the documentation. He needed to work hands-on. His strategy was to stall as much as he could to buy time to track them down. Then someone can rescue Alan and arrest the bomb makers. If he stalled too long, they would find someone else to fix it and a working trigger was something to be avoided at all costs, although he still doubted if anyone could really get it to detonate. He sent the apostles an email saying he was half through studying and then he would need a physical copy to troubleshoot the issue. Alan McPherson tried to guess his new surroundings. It seemed like they kidnapped him a lifetime ago. He had been bound, blindfolded and gagged, put in the back of a bouncy truck and taken on a 14-hour drive. To where, he was not sure. As he arrived, he could smell the ocean, that familiar metallic, whiff of oxidized air and iron-rich seaweed. He was sure he was in some kind of industrial basement. The walls were made of cinder block and the floor, bare concrete. He leaned his back against a concrete pillar and his hands were shackled together in front. They also shackled his legs and put on a chain harness that connected to the pillar. His back ached from being held in such an uncomfortable position for so long. How long had it been? He thought, again, for the millionth time. A day? Two? A week? His shackles had worn through the skin on his wrists, and he was in constant pain. His only comfort was a meager foam pad to lie on. He felt like he was losing his sanity and wallowed in depression. To think a month ago he was living a charmed life, son of a billionaire with a secure future. How things have changed. Now he doubted if he would get out of there alive. His jailer sat across the room, smirking at something on a tablet. He sat on a wooden chair that seemed too small for someone so obese. He had a small table and put a half-full bottle of water, a baseball bat, and a cattle prod on it. A large TV played recordings of Apostle sermons and lessons, loudly. It had been playing all night and all day since they stole him away from his life. Alan stretched his arms to test his range of motion. The only resistance he felt was the weight of the heavy steel chains. He turned to look behind to see what was holding him. The clinking sound caused the jailer to look up. He saw about three feet of slack, 
that should be enough to lie down. It hurt to move, but it hurt to sit still on the hard surface. A length of chain slipped off his back and dropped to the floor with a clank. No messing around sinner or you will be visited by the avenging angel. I don't know how you got spoiled by the brothers in Edmonton, but we won't put up with any of your guff around here. Alan guessed the avenging angel was the baseball bat or the cattle prod and he would rather not find out which. So it must be morning. A new jailer will come with food. He couldn't really afford to skip a meal since his legs were getting thinner. He didn't know what his face looked like, except he had grown an annoying beard and was very dirty. His body was always itchy from lack of bathing, and he couldn't get used to his own degrading smell. A video started that he hadn't seen before, and he was almost interested. The church had become complacent to feminists and sodomites and drifted away from God's example. Adam Teller implored the leadership to return to the scriptures for guidance and forsake the decadence of the land. All to no avail. The leaders watered down our teachings to pander to the masses. That was when our Heavenly Father commanded Adam Teller to gather up his faithful and bring them to a place of reverence, obedience and purity and to call it the Church of the Apostles. He commanded Adam Teller to use the rod against the Gentiles so they may see the light. So that's how these whack jobs got started. Murmured Alan, his voice solo under the sound of the television that the guard couldn't hear him. A key turned in the lock of the steel fire door. A less overweight young man walked through the door and greeted the first jailer. Good morning brother. He carried a tray with a bowl half filled with cereal and milk and placed it on the floor in front of Alan without saying a word. He walked back to the first jailer, and they began speaking with concerned voices and in hushed tones. Alan ate as fast as he could. He couldn't hear much over the sound of the television but thought he could pick out a few words. His eyes blurred since he had to take out his contacts after they kidnapped him, but he could see they were quite animated. Gentile consultant, technical roadblock, and other words that didn't seem to make any sense. The new jailer suddenly turned and glared at Alan. What the devil are you looking at, boy? He picked up the cattle prod and stomped toward Alan. Alan tried to move away until the chain stopped him. No, whispered Alan, in panic. The jailer jabbed Alan in the shoulder. His body convulsed and a hoarse gurgling sound stopped in his throat as his torso slumped to the ground. He picked up the cattle prod and stomped toward Alan. Alan tried to move away until the chain stopped him. No, whispered Alan, in panic. The jailer jabbed Alan in the shoulder. His body convulsed and a hoarse gurgling sound stopped in his throat as his torso slumped to the ground. Kevin resumed his A plan of tracking down the kidnappers slash bomb makers. On his kitchen table, he opened the video from Oppie's Chicken and started watching, starting at the time the email was sent to McPherson. He saw people come and go, but no sign anyone emailed. Maybe one of them did. Another possibility is the time on the camera was wrong. The camera was in the front of the store, pointing toward the back. He kept watching and an hour after the email was sent, a tall, beefy, short-haired man sat down with his back to the camera and opened a tablet. He was chatting with Opie like they knew each other. The mysterious man was sitting and eating some chicken, and Kevin couldn't quite see his face. He turned to the left when talking, but not enough that Kevin could recognize him. The man finally finished eating and turned to leave. Kevin paused the video and did a double take on what he saw. Gideon Charles Johnson, Chuck. Wait. Is that really? Kevin recognized his best friend from the army. The one he risked everything to save in the Ukraine. The time printed on the video was an hour after the email was sent. The time zone on the cameras was one hour off. Kevin hacked into the lens database and, with a little luck, found Chuck and began the long and tedious process of reviewing video from his lenses. He didn't feel good about spying on a friend, but it looked like he might be involved with the apostles, but he sincerely hoped he was wrong. He used a hyperbolic antenna to connect to a Wi-Fi a block away, and the connection was not the best. If downloading was slow and tedious, then watching was even more tedious. Chuck shaving. Chuck working at the construction site. Chuck taking a piss in the portable toilet. Chuck eating wieners and beans. Chuck watching basketball. Chuck slapping his wife. Chuck masturbating to Japanese fetish porn. 
Chuck watching mixed martial arts. Chuck praying before he went to bed. God. He was bored, but also disappointed. The Chuck he thought he knew wouldn't slap a woman. He wouldn't hang around with apostles. He skipped ahead as much as he dared without risking missing something important. He heard half a conversation that might be interesting. Chuck was wearing an earphone, so all Kevin could hear was Chuck's part of the conversation. Have it shipped to the safe house. I'll arrange for someone to be there. I'll get Brother Walters to connect it. Amen. Uh-huh. I'll get him started Monday. Praise Jesus. God be with you, as well, brother. Chuck looked at his one and it displayed a call from someone called Albert. Something was going on, but Kevin didn't know who this Albert was. He recognized Chuck's tone as someone speaking to a superior. Then Chuck went to church, and Kevin was swamped with potential leads. He focused on the ones that Chuck seemed to be more familiar with, in hopes they would lead him to the crime. Kevin noticed fewer apostles had lenses than average, but he now had several who needed lengthy retroactive surveillance. They would lead to others, who would lead to others, and the number of people in the network would grow exponentially. It was 1.15 in the morning and he needed help. He made a call. Hey buddy, what's up? I'm swamped, and I was wondering if you want to get started on working with me. I promise no presentations in front of hundreds of people. I'm glad you said so, or I would have told you I have to wash my hair. I haven't quite forgiven you for that, you know. Kevin chuckled. He liked her sense of humor. Okay, I'll show you what to do. How about tomorrow at my place? Before work? After work. <laughs>